I'd now like to turn to Guntur and Gudmunds, Gudmunds Dottir. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to not quite get it right. I have been practicing and now I've, <laughs> um, I haven't quite succeeded. It's, it's, it's great to, to welcome you, Guntorin. Um, to introduce uh, to everyone, um, Guntorin is Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of Iceland <clears throat> in the Faculty of Icelandic and Comparative Cultural Studies. Her research interests include life writing, memory studies, and contemporary literature. She published widely on these subjects, including in her two books, Borderlines, where she wrote on Jenny Diskey, amongst others, and Representations of Forgetting in Life Writing and Fiction. Her most recent book is an edited volume on Nordic crime fiction uh, with the wonderful, intriguing title, Noir in the North, Genre, Politics and Place. And um, Guntorin's uh, uh, title today is Narrative and Genre, Disky and Life Writing. Thank you so much, Guntorin. Thank you so much and thank you uh, the organizers for uh, getting this off the ground. It's a, it's, it's a great privilege to be here to talk about Diski with a, in Reykjavik with a volcanic eruption on the one hand and pandemic on the other. Uh, so it's exciting times as usual. Um, I want to start today to talk about my talk with uh, two quotes. Uh, the French author Annie Arnaud in her book about her mother in Femme from 1987, she writes, I spent a lot of time reflecting on what I have to say and the choice and sequence of words as if there existed only one immutable order which would convey the truth about my mother. When I am writing, the only thing that matters to me is to find that particular order. Paul Kerr puts it succinctly in his work on time and narrative when he says, narrative gives form to what is unformed. Narrative structure and autobiography can be seen as an attempt to alter the chaos and confusion that is life. This presupposes that what narrative theory has long maintained, that narrative is made up of two elements, fabula and jusé, or histoire and discours. These two quotations offer two different versions of the way in which this ordering of events takes place. Arnaud is looking for the order that she presumes to be already there. She believes she only needs to find it and maintains this, and she maintains this order will in itself bring forth the truth. Ricoeur's notion is that narrative forms something that is unformed, transforming fabula into chuse. Telling one's life is a basic human practice. A narrative is there to establish causality and continuity and allocate meaning to events provides beginnings, middles, and ends. As Peter Brooks points out, narrative is one of the ways in which we speak, one of the large categories in which we think. Plot is its threat of design and its active shaping force, the product of our refusal to allow temporality to be meaningless, our stubborn insistence on making meaning in the world and in our lives. Narrative is then of prime importance for the way in which the autobiographer establishes causality and meaning in her life story. Uh, but as uh, Joanna pointed out earlier, in Diski's term, this is far from being a straightforward process, as she asserts in her last work, In Gratitude, that my particular difficulty is that I don't like writing narrative, but getting on with what happened next to a story that has a middle, an end, and a beginning, you may have noticed. And to top it all, she also claims in her essay on being shallow to have no inner life. For me, on the other hand, all the complexity of my outerness appears to be covering up is an inherent lack of inner person. So already the two mainstays of autobiographical writing, narrative and expression of inner life are in trouble. This poses a problem for a genre defined by Philippe Lejeune as a retrospective prose narrative by a real person on his own life with emphasis on his individuality, in particular, a story of his personality. But her paradoxical stance towards the genres she operates in is part of her makeup as a writer, and this Joanna also mentioned earlier, uh, as of her being a travel writer who professes always to prefer stillness to movement, 
lite kontemplativa rather than lite aktiva. If we take Stendhal's and Rousseau's preambles to their respective autobiographies at face value, then Rousseau claims to write to show us who he is, and whereas Stendhal writes to discover himself. For Diski, however, the answer to the question of why write when faced with his lack of inner self is an existential question. Why convey it? Why make narrative meaning out of it when there is neither narrative or meaning involved? Because it passes the time. Vladimir, from Waiting to Godot, is, insists it would have passed without or without, with or without us. The doing and the kind of doing that is writing is an inability to come to terms with emptiness. In fact, an attempt to escape from it, to turn emptiness into substance, narrative marks on a page, a fundamental lie, a failure at the core. So writing is there to pass the time to fill the emptiness with substance while re realizing the futility of the venture. Writing always takes on form and form can also offer consolation as Frank Kermot asserts, having found form, you have a right to be consoled by it for the good reason that it is authentic and reflects however imperfectly a universal plot, an enchanting order of beginning, middle and end. It is this enchanting order that Diski is suspicious of, as are some, of, some other authors of a generation. In The Invention of Solitude, Paul Auster, for instance, says of himself, like everyone else, he craves meaning. Like everyone else, his life is so fragmented that each time he sees a connection between two fragments, he is tempted to look for meaning in that connection. The connection exists, but to give it a meaning, to look beyond the bare fact of its existence, would be to build an imaginary world inside the real world, and he knows it would not stand. We on they write, and on we read. Connections are made, the emptiness is written and takes on form. Vita contemplativa turns into vita activa. Peter Brooks claims that if the motor of narrative desire uh, is desire, totalizing, building ever larger units of meaning, the ultimate determinants of meaning lie at the end, and narrative desire is ultimately, inexorably, desire for the end. This desire of the end where the ultimate determinants of meaning lie is inherently problematic in autobiography. If, as Walter Benjamin has proclaimed, death is the sanction of everything that the storyteller can tell, he has borrowed his authority from death, endings in autobiography must always in some sense be based on contingency rather than authority, as a life that is narrated has not finished. In Skating to Antarctica, three narrative threats, threats and literary genres, for that matter, travel writing, memoir, diary, are interwoven. Childhood memories, a trip to Antarctica, and her daughter's search for Diski's mother. The first chapter is entitled Schrodinger's Mother. As Diski explains, for the most part, Quantum theory has been of little practical use in my life. And I think that is one of the best sentences I've read in the, in the memoir. Uh, and it's a, a, a sort of a surprising and, and a wonderful revelation. But she goes on to replace Schrodinger's cat with a mother. The cat in the box, according to the theory, is both dead and alive. It is only when it is observed that it is either or. Keeping her mother in this superposition of states suits Diski. As long as she does not look, her mother is both dead and alive and can have no influence over her life. This is the state her mother remains in for the reader till the very end of the text. The text immediately engages the curiosity of the reader who wonders where her mother is, whether her mother is still alive. Will she be the same as Diski remembers? Will she want to find out? And what effect will this knowledge have on her? Even the dedication is designed to get the reader interested and aware of the many possible outcomes of this quest, as Diski dedicates the book to her daughter Chloe, without whom, leaving the sentence appropriately open-ended. One strand of this memoir has therefore a very clear goal and works throughout towards some kind of conclusion. The epigraph from Beckett's Malone dies, then serves to confuse the reader in true Disky fashion. I wonder if I'm not talking yet again about myself, shall I be incapable to the end of lying on any other subject? 
leaving the reader with the sense that even though a conclusion might be reached, it might not be as clear cut as one assumes at the outset. When her daughter first suggests looking for her grandmother by searching for a death certificate, Diski realizes how easily in practical terms it would have been to find out. Funny how easy and obvious it was and what a nonsense it made of, I don't know if my mother is alive or dead. The reality of the easy access to information and Diski's own reluctance to find out, to open the lid of the box, is a constant theme in this text. She has claimed throughout her life not to, uh, to care to know about her mother, not even being curious. This highlights another strand in the text, what her psychoanalysts have called her denial of her unconscious, a trait in herself that she cherishes, and she claims to be a person who would always rather do nothing than to be active. It also puts in stark relief the reader's expectations of the outcome and Diski's own relative indifference. The reader's hermeneutic activity is thereby qualified by Diski's reluctance to engage with her daughter's quest. At the end of the first chapter, her daughter has found a death certificate of someone with at least a similar name to Diski's mother. It still has not answered the question with any certainty, but Diski goes on her Antarctic journey, having realized that she will soon know the truth. It's only in the very last pages that it is revealed that her mother died in 1988. Diski describes finding papers that her daughter had left for her when she gets back from her trip. But it's not her mother's death that shocks her the most, it is the fact that she had been alive for so long after they lost contact. It was as if the painting of my past had acquired a shadow, a new presence, separate but lurking darkly around corners and doorways. There had been the possibility all along up to 1988, the retrospective possibility that she might have made contact. Might, as in my worst early hours anxiety, have turned up in my life. She hadn't, she might have. The shock is to discover that when she looks, she sees not only the state of her mother as it is now, but what was before and all the retrospective possibilities that offers. The power of the might have been becomes almost tangible, a concern that is also apparent in some of her other works. This is though not the only thing that the daughter discovers. She talks to her grandmother's neighbors in Hove and soon the picture emerges of the same difficult and troubled woman Diski remembers and avoided all this time. The possibility that her mother might have been a nice old lady has once and for all been laid to rest and thereby some of Diski's feelings of guilt. It serves as a confirmation for her own view of her childhood and her belief that she would not have been able to have any kind of relationship with her mother. The last sentence in the book depicts a dialogue, sentences, sorry, depict a dialogue between Diski and her daughter. Her daughter asks if Diski is pleased that she went to Hove to talk to the neighbors. Very, very pleased, thank you. That's okay, good to know about your mother at last. Yes, I think it is. At least one of the questions posed at the outset has been answered. Diski's mother is no longer in a superposition of states, but the question remains whether it was worth knowing. Finding out has changed some of Diski's perception of her own past, reinforced others. Peter Brooks states that the tenuous, fictive, arbitrary status of ends clearly speaks to and speaks of an altered situation of plot, which no longer wishes to be seen as end determined, moving toward full predication of narrative sentence, claiming a final plenitude of meaning. Skating to Antarctica reflects this no notion. It does answer the central question and by leaving it to the very end, uses conventional narrative strategies to keep the reader interested. But although the question whether her mother is dead or alive might seem the most obviously important one, Diski raises other questions throughout the text. That fact makes the read reader query why we take the importance of the original question for granted. Why is it better to act rather than not to act? Why is it always better to know? Therefore, although the ending is clearly not arbitrary, it has lost some of its importance and weight by being constantly questioned and its significance doubted throughout the text, so the work does not acquire a final plenitude of meaning. No surprise then, when she later explains in Stranger on a Train, I hate neat endings. I have an antipathy 
to finishing in general, the last page, the final strains of a chord, the curtain falling on the echo of a closing speech, living happily ever after, all that great so me. The finality is false, because there you still are, the reader, the observer, the listener, with a gasping chasm in front of you, left out of the resolution of the story, that seduced you into thinking yourself inside it. The last work, however, has the unavoidable and ultimate ending. But as usual in her work, she resists the lure of the enchanting order of conventional narration. She is extremely wary of the metaphors and platitudes usually employed when writing on cancer. As elsewhere in her work, she pulls against any kind of thought that is taken for granted, that is assumed to be true, and questions it and queries it. Remember, this is the woman with no inner life. She is especially irked by the use of the journey as metaphor and rails against it, only to be pulled back into it. It's inescapable. From one state to another, how can the journey not come to mind? That's the price of living in time. Why should I mind so much? Why should I mind so much now? Because journeys end. In more general terms, these thoughts also apply to her as a travel writer who would rather stay still and wants nothing more than to refuse going on that journey. It may be the metaphor in its concomitant narrative structure is needed, as she says, Maybe it's just too difficult to find a way to avoid giving the experience a beginning and an end. And with that, the ending is no longer arbitrary, it is complete. This key's ambivalence towards the possibilities of form and meaning making shows how the type of narrative structure and organization autobiographers choose is clearly linked to the autobiographical identity they create. Doubts about the causality narrative structure establishes reflects doubts about the possibility of writing a definitive account of one's own life and an awareness of the fictional aspects of all narrative. The essay is perhaps the perfect form in avoiding the ever-present pool of neat narrative structures and there Disky excels. Montaigne is ever-present in her essays, not least in On Trying to Keep Still. The essay gives the author freedom to inspect anything her heart desires. It allows her to investigate, to try, I say, out certain ideas or thoughts where small truths, fragments of knowledge reign rather than larger sweeping truths and scientific conclusions. It has space for humor, for playing, for things that go against systematic thought or practical use. It is the perfect outlook, outlet for vita contemplativa rather than vita activa, Although paradoxically, it requires Vita Activa because, as Disky explained, writing is doing. Whether we believe narratives to give form to what is unformed, or for the events in our life to have inherently a narrative order that is there for the author to find, it is clear how much narrative conventions and narrative structures influence the meaning making process, and by questioning these conventions and confounding expectations, this key draws the reader in and confronts him or her with what she termed the falseness of finality. Thank you.